Here's a case study uh, based on an application we're just uh, tuning. It's a very interesting application. I really can't talk about the specifics of it, but um, this application, we expected it to be CPU bound. Expect it. There's absolutely no locks, nothing in there to actually prevent it from fully utilizing a CPU. We had one Java thread per hardware thread under these conditions, and um, you know we just let it go, right? So we used two memory configurations. Um, you now there's not a lot of what I call long, long-lived objects in this uh, particular system. As a matter of fact, a lot of them die very, 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 very quickly, right? So we figured a small, you know, one gig heap should have really have done it. And since there was a lot of uh, short-term, short-lived objects in here. What we did was we just gave it a very large um, young generational space. Now, normally the young generational space is about one eighth of total RAM, and we're going to further subdivide that by using <clears throat> what's known as the, as a, you know, the, using a um, survivor ratio. Okay, so we want to make the survivor spaces larger also. So in this case, we said let's give young half of RAM, and let's give equal amounts of memory to um, Eden, Survivor 0, and Survivor 1, right? That was one configuration. The other configuration we tried was just say, okay, let's skip trying to tune the heap, let's just give it four gigs like everybody else does, and let's just like see what happens with that, right? Um, so this thing ran for uh, about 420 seconds um, in, in these particular runs, and at the small heap, there's our transactional rate, right? That's the rate at which we're retiring um, the requests. With a large heap, you can see that, wow, we got like a huge, you know, 50% better throughput with a larger heap. And the question is, why such a huge difference, uh, given that the one gig should have been enough memory to, to manage this particular application? Now, if we look at the time in, uh, if, so if you look at this thing called GC throughput, this calculation, right? So what we're actually doing is say, let's look at the time stopped for GC um, compared to the overall runtime, And we'll use that as a measure of how efficient our, our garbage collector is, is in, in, when it's running. So generally our target for GC throughput is somewhere around 5% or less. You know, the closer we get to 1%, the happier life is. Um, as it turns out, the GC throughput for the small heap application was 23.4, you know, whatever, 23%. And strangely enough, for the large heap was 0.23%. So, if we start looking at this, right, we're going to say that th that's the total number of transactions we had in the large heap versus how many transactions we had in the small heap. And the question is, where are the missing transactions? So are the trans is the transaction loss due to garbage collection? Well, we can actually figure that out. So we took the 420, multiplied it by 0.23, and that meant that we spent 96.6 seconds in garbage collections. So let's assume that the transactional rate of 1133047 is actually true. Okay, so if we actually multiply that all out, we can see that the transactional transactions lost due to garbage collection are still less than the number we got with the larger heap. So conclusion here is that garbage collection overhead accounted for about 50% of all the lost transactions. But there's also another portion of the story, right? It's like, where's the other 50%? In this case here, the small heap collected at 6.24 times every 10 milliseconds. Now I use the 10 milliseconds quite intentionally here because that's the natural rate of contact switching on a, on a machine, yeah? Right? And now we're at 6.42 uh, times that natural rate of contact switching. With a large heap, we're at 0.0065 Context switches per 10 milliseconds, which generally means that we're at one context switch per 10 millisecond. And, you know, we can actually see that 
right here in this CPU utilization. If you look at small heap, we can see that we have 74% CPU utilization in user space, that's basically Java running, and 7% system. Whereas if we go to the big heap, we can see we have 99% CPU utilization, where we only have 1% system. Okay? So that means we can have more analysis that we can do here, right? Uh, so if you do 74% user plus 7% system implies that we're wasting 32% of the cycles on our machine. We're just not utilizing them, right? So if, now if I take the 420 seconds, multiply it by 0.32, I come up with 134.4 seconds of that runtime wasted doing nothing, multiply it by our transactional rate, add it into what we already had, and now we can see that I'm really darn close. So you can see that there's two costs for the garbage collection here, right? First is the actual cost of the collection itself. And then if we start having it caught too, you know, occur too frequently, what we're actually getting in this case is that we're getting a GC-induced lock contention problem, right? And that's caused by the safe point because all the threads have to stop at the safe point before you know, the GC threads can start. And that causes the thread schedule to work harder, depresses CPU utilization, okay? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, th and that's really what's responsible in this case for the other uh, lost 50%. Yes, question? Can I ask what the 30, where the 32% come from? 32%? Yeah, okay. So um, there's 26% of just idle CPU. Now, it's not really idle. It's CPU that I can't get to because of the condition of the system, okay? So it looks idle, but you, you, you can't get there. Um, and the reason why you can't get there is that 7% system time is 6% too high. So by expanding the heap, having the, having the context switch happen less frequently, I reduce that 7% down to 1%. One, uh, 1%. So that means I have um, 26 plus 6 equals 32. Okay. okay, does that make sense? I can do that again if you want. Okay, so basically what I'm going to assume is that in order to get to that other 26% of CPU, I have to reduce system time from 7% down to 1%. And when I reduce system time from 7% down to 1%, I'm going to pick up another 6% that I can fully utilize. So when I add the two together, then all of a sudden I'm at uh, the 32%. Okay, does that make sense now? Okay, now with that 32% CPU and my CPU bound application, it means that now I can essentially recover all of the transactions that I lost. So in this case, how often your collector is running is also important because how many times is it forcing your system to, to context switch? Now, if you're using a CMS collector, right, parallel collector, you get like stop, start. CMS collector, that happens twice. Phase one, phase four of the collection cycle are stop the world. So in this case, more memory was actually a good thing. And it was a good thing because we had temporary objects and we really had, temp you know, and the temporary objects were being swept away very quickly uh, by the system uh, at zero cost. So that really wasn't the problem. The problem was that the space was so small. There were so many temporary objects being created that was causing the garbage collector to run really, really frequently. Right? So we would go into the logs and simply count the number of times. What's the frequency of collection in this case? Um, Case study number two. So we have one web app here, four different memory configurations. So again, we're going to play around with heap size, new ratio, and uh, survivor ratio. So, and we'll look at CPU profile again. So in this case here, we have one giga heap. Our new ratio is eight, survivor ratio is eight. So those are pretty much default settings. And we can see that our average response time for each transaction is uh, 149 milliseconds. We have a median of 84 milliseconds, 90th percentile of 345 milliseconds, max of 1728, and the benchmark was running without producing any errors. Now, if I just simply say, okay, let's use the same tactic, 
an extend heap. You know, you can see we didn't really get that much of a bump in average response time, but we sure took it in variance. And look at the max. So in this case, we actually didn't make things much better, but we made certain conditions much worse, right? And so let's try something else here then. Let's go back to the one gig, and let's just resize the internal memory pools so that we have our, our, um, you know, our new ratio set to one, so that we give Eden, you know, young generation space half, and, and our survivor ratio equal to one, so we're giving our... S0, S1, and Eden. They're all the same size in this particular case. And look at that. 82, so there's a huge jump in response time here. Well, you know, our our, and our variability is down, and our max is down. So the whole picture becomes much, much better. So in this case, one gig really was enough. But what was important in getting right in this case was all the sizes of the internal spaces. And that's where we, you want to basically look at things like this, right? It's like, you know, what's the difference between these two particular runs here? Well, you can see that um, those are the tenuring thresholds over time, as calculated by, uh, well, essentially the garbage collector. In order to, you know, in, in any, you can see the top line is that tenuring threshold 15. So, you know, what does that mean? That means that everything worked normally. All of the other stuff below that means that I had a premature tenuring event, which means that I was taking stuff from Eden, putting it into survive, uh, sorry, putting it in through the survivors, and then into tenured space too early. Okay? If I put all this extra garbage into tenured space, that means I'm going to run full GCs much more frequently than I need to. By actually increasing the survivor space sizes in this case, I'm actually catching the garbage where it's cheap to catch it, to catch it at, right, in the young generational space. So again, you want to look at measurements like this to tell you, okay, are my survivor spaces big enough? Are they, small, you know, are they too small in that case? And where should my tenuring threshold be? So one of the things you want to do with tenuring threshold is like when you start looking at this data, is decide that, okay, my garbage collector is catching, you know, most of the objects that are going to die at about age six or seven. So after age six or seven, if my tenuring threshold is 15, you know, all those objects are going to live. They're going to get promoted anyways. So we can reduce copy cost by just saying, you know, when they reach age seven, promote them. They're going to live anyways. So there's a kind of a balance that you want to, uh, to bring to the, to the table in that case. Um, okay, so what happens if we just give this thing two gigs of RAM with a new ratio and a survivor ratio setting like that? Again, more RAM made things worse. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.